Well, I'm so delighted to be at South by Southwest, even if in a virtual format, and to be able to talk about some of the amazing work that we've had the privilege of doing with Emirates Team New Zealand over the last year plus. Um, this is really a story that started for us in, in 2019, and, and I guess for Team New Zealand, well, preparations started getting underway well before then. I'm Jack McCorbo. I'm one of the co-founders of Pond and Black and its chief scientist and uh, partner in McKinsey. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by Dan Bernasconi, who's the head of design at Emirates Team New Zealand. Okay, so a bit of hygiene. We're recording this um, you know, before the racing may have happened. Um, and so, you know, if in some of the commentary that follows, we seem, um, you know, a little bit sociopathically detached from the outcome, it's because we don't know what it is. Let's start with the America's Cup. Um, you know, first off, it's the oldest sports trophy in the world, bar none. And throughout its history, it's always been something, a technology race, um, bringing both designs to the race that look to take maximum advantage of, of the rules for any given competition. Uh, Dan, can you tell us a little bit more maybe about that side of the sport in particular, about you know the America's Cup being a technology race? Sure. I mean, what's most visible to the public is, is the sailing side of it, the sailing race. Um, um, this time around, there's 11 sailors on the boat. But those guys uh, are really just sort of a really small part of the team. We've got a team of over 100 people, and that includes, um, other than the sailing team, designers, shore crew, boat builders, um, and then a, a full team of, of support, um, sort of accounting, uh, medics, a chef, and so on. Um, and then within the design team, we've got pretty much every discipline of engineering, so structural engineering, materials, uh, naval architecture, hydrodynamics, aerodynamics, electronics, hydraulics, mechanical engineering, software engineering, and simulation. Um, and I guess our job as designers is to make the sailor's life easy. So ultimately, um, if the if the two boats in the in the America's Cup match are very similar in performance, then the the sailors, um, you know, we, we would back our sailors to to win the cup for us. If our boat's a little bit slower, it becomes incredibly difficult for them to do that. And if we're able to produce a boat that is faster than the opposition, then uh, it, it makes our makes it a little bit easier for our sailors. So. Ultimately, it is really a design race, um, and we've been working in this campaign for three years now to design the fastest boat that's going to be racing uh, two weeks tomorrow. Um, and the, the class rule, the rules under which we operate, are pretty open, so there's a huge amount of scope for design and optimization. So when we look at the, the other teams that we're racing, um, you know, they've all put a huge amount of effort and R&D into this. Um, and we're hoping that, that what we've done is just one step ahead of, of where they are so that when we come to race in a couple of weeks' time, um, we'll, we'll just have that edge over the other boat. Maybe starting to lead into the, you know, the work that we did together, um, maybe in the first place, it, it, it would be great if you could tell us a little bit more about how the work actually, you know, how the design and engineering work actually gets done, like, and, and maybe speak to the... Um, you know, the importance of virtual simulation in, in the process of design and engineering. Yeah, the, these boats that we're racing, they're 75-foot foiling monohulls. They're incredibly complex boats and take a long time to build. So um, we've got a, a full team here, and it takes us around a year to build. And that's from the start of construction to the end of construction. But... The process actually starts a long time before that, and our design um, window may start um, several months before the start of construction. And so that on the day the construction starts is the day we finally lock in our whole shape. And then after that, we're keeping, um, keeping up with the, the build team and producing designs of components just in time for them to be built. But ahead of all of that, 
in order for us to be even remotely competitive, we have to go through many, many design iterations. And we can't build all of those iterations and test them on the water to see which is quicker. So all of our design is based on simulation results. Um, there's, there's virtually zero on water A-B testing of components. It's all about um, what works best in simulation. So ultimately, wh whoever's got the most um, performant simulation tools is the team that's going to end up designing the fastest boat. Um, looking back a few years, uh, simulations that we carried out were steady state, um, what we call VPP, velocity performance prediction, where you're looking at the boat in equilibrium at a steady speed in steady wind conditions on flat water and looking at what configuration of the yacht would produce the, the best equilibrium speed in a given wind speed. Um, moving forward, we're, we're now in boats that are incredibly dynamic and majority of the, the race, the boats are actually accelerating from the last maneuver. Um, so there's very little time when the boat's actually in a steady condition. So the simulations we run now are fully dynamic simulations where we're simulating the yacht at around 50 hertz and modeling the performance of that yacht around an entire race lap. Um, these are simulation tools which we've developed in-house um, over many years and we're modeling the aerodynamics and the hydrodynamics in real time to enable us to model uh, that performance dynamically. It would be great to talk a little bit about like the problem that we that, that, that we tackled, right? And so we, we were looking at maybe solving that a hard control problem. And, you know, we, we use a specific technique here in, in deep reinforcement learning in, in, in order to be able to solve that problem. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about the problem itself. And then after that, we can talk about like the ways in which we, we tackled it. Yeah. Um, so once you have these dynamic simulations um, you have to drive the boat around the course in the simulation to determine a lap time and typically the way we've done this um, is to have actual sailors driving a, a mock-up of the yacht um, connected to the real-time simulation and the sailors would uh, we, we would have a helmsman, a wing trimmer, a foil trimmer, and, and two offside foil trimmers. And so we would get all these guys together in our simulator and um, go through sessions of, of doing laps um, through simulated weather conditions, simulated waves, and so on. And I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of experimental noise in that because even our top level um, sailors you know, they, they don't do exactly the same thing um, every time. Uh, so we have to do several laps um, of a particular design configuration in a particular wind speed. Then we would change the conditions and do several more laps and so on. So you have to do many, many laps um, in order to, to get some statistically significant result. Um, the, the other issue there is actually the practicality of, of getting all those sailors together. Um, you know, they've got a pretty busy program on the water um, as well as many things off the water and their, their training program. Um, and as we get further into the campaign and the boats get more uh, and more refined, the differences we're looking for become smaller and smaller. So whereas at the beginning of the campaign you might be looking for something that would uh, give you a 30 second gain um, over the course of a, a 30 minute race. Whereas now we're sort of at the pointy end of the campaign, we're looking for differences of, you know, of the order of one second per 30 minute race. So the, the, the amount that you can get out of um, real sailors with, with some natural human variability is quite small. And you might think, well, that, if, if it's that small, then why does it really matter? But it's because through the design iterations, you, you're just making um, an aggregate of all of these little one second bits here and there, which ultimately do add up. So every second really does count for us. And as we, as we optimize um, 
we're looking for smaller and smaller differences and more and more accurate simulation results. Um, so when, when we started talking to Quantum Black, it was about whether we could imagine some uh, agent, some, some software agent, which would drive the boat completely repeatably um, and be able to do simulated laps at absolutely optimal performance um, and give us a result of a lap time for a particular design of boat. So altogether, what you saw in that video was um, a, a deep reinforcement learning bot um, that was production deployed top, you know, Team New Zealand's high fidelity physics engine um, that can sail a new boat design in that digital environment under a pretty broad set of conditions. Um, and, and that stands out as the one of the most complex deployments of deep reinforcement learning in the public cloud. And I, I think it's worth belaboring the scale of, of the challenge. Um, one way to think about the hardness of, of the problem is, is using a measure called game tree complexity, um, which, which basically equates the size of the state space we had to optimize over and master while accounting for the set of possible game paths or the, the, the sequence of, of decisions that need to be taken. Um, chess has a game tree complexity of, of 36. Um, Go, which is an extremely complex board game that DeepMind famously mastered with AlphaGo, with AlphaGo Zero. Um, has a game tree complexity of 170. And, and by that measure, our selling problem here is a game tree complexity of, of nearly 2,900. And Dan, you, you mentioned it was an extremely experimental approach, I think, when, when we got going. Um, given the new regulations, given the set of new technologies to master the monohull designs that you described, um, wh why, why hone in and why, um, in, in a way, saddle your chances to such an experimental approach? Yeah, I mean, as a, a team, we've always, um, our philosophy has always been to push the technology as, as hard as we possibly can. Uh, all of our, our competitors are, are attempting to do the same. And we know that if, if we're not right at the forefront of technology, then we won't be competitive. When, when we developed this class of yacht, the AC-75, um, there was no other yacht like it, no other foiling monohull. Um, and it, the America's Cup is a strange competition where the previous winners effectively get to decide the class of yacht um, in which you race the next edition. And Typically, going back in history, teams that have won have, have chosen to stay with the same class of yacht because they've effectively just proven that, that they're the, the best team at designing and sailing that particular yacht. So why would you change it? Um, we actually had the opposite approach where we believe really strongly in our team's ability um, to develop R&D. So we thought by changing the yacht to something completely new, we, we backed ourselves uh, to to be able to develop um, just slightly ahead of our, our competition. And I think we've got a great culture within our team, within the management, um, that really believe in, in pushing technology forwards. And whilst we were probably leading the field in, in sailing in uh, terms of bringing dynamic simulation into the design process in the previous cut, if we just did a sort of cut and paste of that and use the same techniques to develop our yacht this time, then we'd be doing the same as everybody else because uh, everybody else is now doing dynamic simulation. And so to me, the, the next step is really to extract more from that dynamic simulation uh, by, by using um, a computer agent to, to sail the yacht. We're able to, to get far more throughput of simulations, um, far more design iterations within a given amount of time, and be able to differentiate between those design iterations to a, a much higher fidelity because the, the agent we know is going to be completely repeatable and every time is going to get exactly the, the optimal solution around that lab. But, but as you say, the, the, 
the complexity of it is, is huge. Um, and you know, when we when we started talking to Pon and Black, we were very very skeptical as to whether the problem could be solved at, at this point in time. Um, we it, it's a difficult boat to sail. Um, you know, I've been developing the simulation tools for, for 10 years, and as I'm, I'm using them every day, but I can't sail the AC-75 yacht in any reasonable way. You know, if I tried to get a lap time around the course, uh, then, you know, it would be pretty hopeless. And for our sailors, they're, they're training for um, months and months in a simulator, and even now on the water, every day we go out, they get a little bit better. So. And these are sailors that are absolutely the the um, world champions in in sailing. You know, they're, they're Olympic gold medalists. They're right at the top of their game. So it's a very very difficult problem um, to be able to sail a, a simulated yacht uh, around the course optimally. Um, but you know, we were we were up for the challenge, and, and Quantum Black were really excited to to take on that challenge too. So. Um, yeah, we, we, we gave it a go and um, really impressed with the results. You know, I, I find it pretty amazing that you've, you've been working on that simulation environment for the last 10 years and trying to improve its fidelity and, you know, teaching a bot to sail within that environment also, you know, meant that the simulation environment itself was being used in ways in which it, you know, it hadn't been used before. And in some way that, that pushed the need to improve the fidelity of the simulation environment in, in in some way so there's a there's a long list of technical challenges that had to be overcome um but we got in you know in, in many ways to the other side of that um when did you know that we we had cracked the problem um and what you know both for you but also for the designers and the um the the sailors um what what were some of the reactions to the team um, you know, once they started seeing that the problem in some way was, you know, the problem of sailing the boat within that virtual environment was being solved by the bot. Yeah, there were various milestones along the way. Um, the, I mean, looking back on it now, the, the sort of the easier part of it was sailing in a straight line through through wind shifts and gusts and, and waves. Um, now, that, that in itself is quite a challenge um, to get really optimal performance and make the most of, of every gust and trim trim all the controls on the yacht accordingly to, to what's, what's happening in the environment. Um, but the real challenge was the maneuvers, getting through tacks and jibes, uh, which is a huge amount of choreography between all the different control surfaces, um, when you lower a foil, what you do with the foil flap angles, what you do with the, the rudder, the rudder rake, um, the sail, camber, and so on. So there's a huge amount of uh, complexity to get from sailing on one tack to sailing on the other, um, going through a maneuver and staying on the foils whilst you do that. And then beyond that, doing that optimally, um, losing the minimum amount of distance you, you can in a tack. So there were, there were milestones along the way, but when we saw that it could get through attack successfully and well, you know, that was definitely, uh, you know, when we, we really started to take notice and think, yeah, this has, has got real potential. But I think, you know, the ultimate, the ultimate test, um, it was when it started beating the sailors and um, that's when our sailors started to take notice. Um, you know, for a long time through the development of this project, uh, they'd seen it as sort of an interesting, uh, an interesting tool that maybe had some potential in the future. But I think when when it actually started being able to get better lap times than the sailors, suddenly they were massively interested and wanted to know every detail of how it was getting through a maneuver uh, more quickly than they they could. And started to to analyze, uh, you know, what it was doing when it was putting the boards down, what it was doing with the flap angles, what it was doing with the sail trim, um, and and starting to learn from it and and see, well, you know, if it can get through maneuvers uh, better than we can, then we we better learn how to do that. So um, 
you know that's that was really the gold standard for us um that that it could do a lap better than our, our our crew and completely repeatably and then you know that's the point at which it, it starts bringing in huge amount of value for us as designers i i, I think that says something also pretty special about you know the sailors but also you know more broadly the, the culture at you know within the team at team new zealand um that you know everyone is 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 so incredibly committed to you know to the improvement of their craft and the way in which they work you know like no one is terribly precious or ideological about how they currently do their work or how they currently sail the boat wh whatever that work might be um but you know to the extent that there's a way to improve on that and in this case from you know the the adoption of uh, the application of a specific technology um you know that everyone is receptive to it and tries to make it as successful as possible and tries to be more successful because of that technology i i think that's pretty pretty amazing i mean can you can you speak maybe just a little bit more to you know the culture within the team and um and and, and the ways in which it helped on this front and maybe the ways in which it, it helps, you know, just with the reinvention of, you know, what the team is and how it works. Yeah, we, we work really hard as a team on that team culture. Um, it's, it's a really great environment to work in and it, it has to be, um, you know, leading up to the cup now we're working uh, seven days a week, uh, really long days and there's just this universal desire in the team to win. Um, whether whether you're um, a sailor or a designer or a boat builder or, or an accountant, um, we've all got just one singular goal. And I think it, it really helps that culture that you know we're all believing so strongly in, in that one thing that, that we want to win and we want to produce the, the best boat possible. Uh, to help us do that. So, you know, looking across the team, um, it, it doesn't matter where ideas come from. Um, you know, whether it's uh, a design idea comes from, from an intern or, or from the, the skipper of the yacht or, or me as chief designer. Um, if it's a good idea, then we'll, we'll take it and we'll run with it. And I think we've got to be really really receptive to new ideas um the if you had a culture of um you know, not being not being open to, to trying new things then it, it would be very difficult to move forwards and we're we're lucky as i said earlier that, that our management um really believes in the design team and the sailing team uh, so they make it very easy for us to, to test things. There's very little resistance um, if, if an idea is put on the table. And for sure, the, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, crazy ideas and a lot of them that, that don't make it past the first post. But um, having that environment where it's encouraged to, to put ideas forward makes it, makes it really easy for the, the good ones to sort of bubble up to the surface. Um, and although our design process is really well developed, we've worked together as a team now for um, 10 years with most of the same people. We've got really strong optimization processes. Um, we, we still benefit a lot from having guys who are not trained as engineers, so um, particularly the sailors, who, who maybe don't approach things with a sort of typical engineering mindset. Um, to, to throw in some sort of genetic mutations into the mix and just really question what we're doing. And you know, even if 95% of those things um, do turn out to be uh, sort of unworkable, that you get, you get those sort of nuggets of 5% gold where uh, it really changes the way we think and uh, has a real creative input to, to our sort of well-developed optimization processes from our vantage point right now as we film this crunch time is you know <laughs> is is almost upon us um how, how are you feeling uh, a little bit stressed um yeah we've we've been watching our competition um sailing the the lead-up races the, the way the america's cup is structured is 
that all of the other teams race against each other and the winner of that Challenger Cup um, then races our team as the defender, the holder of the cup, uh, in what's called the match. So we've, we're watching really uh, with keen interest. It's down to two challengers now, and um, that will likely be decided this weekend. So um, watching very closely to see who we will end up racing. And they, they've got uh, both got very competitive yachts, but slightly different strengths in different areas, um, which will perhaps affect how we choose to make our final choice of components um, that, that we race with. Uh, I think, you know, we're ready. We're, uh, we, um, we're keen to race, excited to race. Um, but yeah, al always some nerves. You know, there's so much in it. You, you, you put three and a half years of your life into um, what's going to be decided in a couple of weekends of racing. So um, yeah, a lot of anticipation. Dan, thanks so very much for, for joining us. It's been, you know, a real pleasure working together um, and uh, best of luck for, you know, on, you know, in, in the finals. Um, and we look forward to working with you in uh, on the 37th edition. Sure, and it's been a pleasure. And it, it's just been really great to, to work with you and your team. So thanks very much. Mm -hmm.